Hello and welcome to this post Pro Tour New Jersey episode of Steel First Speaks. I have just gotten off a plane this morning, but I have the day off and I have pretty much a full day. Um, I wasn't planning on taking a day off, but I had to take a day off because my flight was delayed. Um, you know, my feelings go out there to anyone else who is simultaneously um, being delayed on a flight. Um, as always, my name is Finbar, aka Steelfur. I am a flesh and blood player based out of London. Um, recently uh, finished 95th at the first Pro Tour in New Jersey. So does that make me one of the top 100 fab players in the world? I don't know. Maybe it does, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to that. Uh, this is a good place to come to for all of your both competitive, but also cultural and news-based fab updates. Um, I like to break down decisions that LSS are making, good, bad, community responses, as well as look at things like meta, how things are shifting, um, how things change. I have a few different playlists, including this one where I do more um, talking and the Steel First Supremacy playlist um, where I do more uh, competitive focused videos. So obviously I've just got back from the Pro Tour New Jersey. If you want to know how my specific days went, I put out a load of tweets. You can find those on Twitter at Steel First Speaks. Um, I also did uh, post videos each day. Um, talking through my matchups, what happened, what went wrong, what didn't go well. Um, I went 8-6 in the end, which is not, you know, I, I would have liked to at least go sort of like 10 wins or something like that. I knew pretty, we'll say pretty early on, because I made day two on a 4-3 score uh, that I wasn't going to make the top eight, uh, but I was playing for the top 64, a bit of money to help defray the costs or the top 32. But it was pretty clear from... You know, the way I was playing that I didn't really deserve to get that far, but I'm happy enough to go 8-6 and get some sort of positive uh, ELO scores. Uh, so if you want the breakdown of like match by match and things like that, um, you can watch those other videos uh, that are on my channel. They should just be, you know, Pro Tour New Jersey, etc. Um, so, but the, the, the main takeaway for me, and I think this is kind of important, a lot of people are, are low sort of having takeaways, is that I have a lot of work to do. This is my first like super large professional event. The largest uh, card game tournament I've been to prior to this was the L5R LCG World Championships, where I made top 32 in a field of 350. Um, you know, so I don't have a lot of experience that some of the players who've come from Magic the Gathering have, have played games more competitively will have. Um, we'll talk about, you know, stuff like that in a bit. So the main learning for me, I guess, if you watch those videos, is that I have a lot to learn that isn't just you know, building a deck, optimizing a deck, sorting out all those stuff, because the things that actually let me down on the day of the tournament were stuff like not making sure my life total was updated in one game, which meant I took more damage than I could afford to take because I had the wrong number written down. And it seems so silly, but, you know, especially for me as someone with dyspraxia, writing is not something that I naturally reach to um, when I'm doing tasks because I type all, all of my writing and all of my work. So... You know, clearly that's identified as an area where I need to make sure that I'm actually tracking, keeping track of the game state much more fluidly. Like, And I was very, very good on certain elements of that. Like I knew when my opponent pitched certain power cards. Okay, they pitched a pummel on turn two. You know, now it's coming going to come back around. They pitched Eclipse on turn one. They're going to get it at the end of the game. Like I was tracking a lot of stuff. I knew how many resources my opponent had. What are the risks I'm going to get hit with an attack reaction here? All of that stuff I was tracking very, very well. But then the small things like, you know, not putting the right damage down from um, one attack and then blocking wrong because of it. Um, and that, you know, you can get a full breakdown of what happened there. Um, and also just, you know, approaching a game too casually, not checking all of my equipment before I flipped it over, not flipping over Null Rune versus a chain player, which, uh, you know, that that's a hard matchup for me because I was playing Prism anyway. But I made it much harder for myself by just not actually preparing properly for the game. So, you know, there are a few learnings to take away from that. The first one, of course, is, um, you know, I need to practice more. I think there is always there is always room to practice more. I don't think you're ever really, you know, I don't think you're ever really done practicing for an event that size. I think you kind of just have to keep going with it, you know. Um, and you can't just sort of, you know, do a certain number of games and then just walk away. Uh, but I will say that, like, I feel like I could have could have practiced more, could have done more work. Um, I did have a five day wedding before the tournament, so I couldn't put in as much time as everyone else did. Um, you know, after the band of restricted announcement was uh, announced, I immediately had to leave the country and leave the internet behind to go to a small 
uh, chalet in France and, and attend a wedding. But the practice is one thing, and obviously making sure I'm practicing more, making sure I'm getting reps on the decks that I need with, with the right people and making the tweaks that I need. Um, and the other thing I think is just making sure that my meta game play, you know, of the tracking and calculation and things like that is good. And if I do those two things well, then I expect, of course, to perform better at the next Pro Tour that I go to and I play in, which, you know, I don't know where that's going to be because I haven't currently got a PTI to use for Lille. Um, you know, and obviously, if they are looking for casters for the Pro Tour in Lille, I'm going to be applying for that because it's a European event and we'll see if they take me. Um, you know, uh, so there's there's lots of stuff sort of going on, but, you know, uh, ultimately, I'm kind of, it's kind of good and bad. On the one hand, yes, I made very some very silly mistakes, like not putting out Null Rune, like mistracking my life total and, and basically not being able to block properly uh, because of how I phrased something. But all of these things become very important for learning, I guess, the tolerances of the game and what I need to do to make sure that those windows are closed. And that will in turn, you know, help me do better at the next event because all the people I know who did very well at the event have mastered a lot of those little things and don't let those things, you know, mess them up. That being said, the person who did win, uh, Pablo, um, you know, he missed a shackle in uh, the semi-finals, and then, you know, he didn't. He he was like, "Oh, can I trigger it?" And his opponent was like, "No, of course you can't. It's the semi-finals of the Pro Tour." Uh, but he played really cleanly, except for that. But my point is more that, you know, for all of you who are listening to this podcast and it's resonating with you that there's a small mistake you made. Um, and we have a list of them in uh, the UK sort of chat group where everyone's put in the mistake they made that was just like really, you know, sort of, oh God. Um, and everyone did them. So I, I kind of want to convey that feeling, you know, you're listening to me. I finished 8-6. Eight, eight, I went to day two. I went 95th. You're thinking, hey, that's that's a really good player. He must have played really well. I did not. Right? I was jet lagged. I made mistakes all over the place. And everyone did, even people I know who finished in 40th. People I know who made the top 32, top 64, even the, the eventual champion. There, there, are, there are lots of mistakes. So don't beat yourself up too much if you also made mistakes like that. Um, but identify it as a place that you can, as a player, improve. And obviously, if you want to do well at these large events, you are going to have to improve. And I, personally, am well, I'm going to have to improve. And also, you know, I've had a lot of comments from people, especially on that last video where I talked about the rulings and things that led to me losing a game because I blocked and how I phrased it and all these kind of things. And people were saying, you're definitely wrong on your opinion because you did you did say what you said and your opponent therefore was justified in killing you instead of letting you play a defense reaction. It's not really relevant to me whether I was right or wrong in that situation, right? Um, my point of that video, and, and I've kind of said this to everyone who's responding to the feedback, is I should never have been in that situation at all. Um, the, the 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 point of failure to me is the misrepresentation of my own board state by not writing down the correct life total. It's not the argument that I proposed a shortcut. I should never have a not written down the right life total and a b never used language that allowed my opponent to create a shortcut that led to me not being able to play a defense reaction from hand. Right? Those are two very specific learnings that kind of influenced all the learnings I'm taking from the Pro Tour, which is. You know, you need to tighten up your language, your communication, so your opponent doesn't get to infer things that they don't know or that uh, you haven't told them. And also don't suggest things that you aren't actually willing to suggest, you know, like that that you don't have any reactions to play. Make sure you're not skipping steps unless you, you genuinely want those to be skipped. You know? I think that's very important. And that happened a few times, um, a few windows with ALS where I let my opponents go too fast. And because of that, I didn't feel like it was justified to play ALS on them uh, because they'd kind of skipped ahead already. Um, and I should just make clear to my opponents that I expect them to go slower. Um, and I will say, I will say that I had, you know, there was definitely a bit of shenanigans going on on that front. You know, I did play against one chain player who, uh, shall we say, they got all their shackles, banished them very, very quickly at the start of their turn uh, in a very practiced manner. And the second I said, I need you to pause on the last card um, so I can decide if I have any reactions. They started pausing on the last card in a very practiced manner. So, you know, in my head, that person was very clearly like banishing all of their stuff very quickly, um, hoping that I would never tell them not to and then I would miss a window to respond with ALS. 
And then when I told them to, they, they switched to the other mode that they were also very practiced with, showing that they knew that Prism will, has a window to respond there, but they were hoping that I didn't know or I wasn't going to call them out on it so they could skip it, right? Um, so there's lots, of, there's lots of stuff going on at this level of competitive event you kind of have to think of that makes it quite interesting. I think that's quite interesting. So those that's my kind of general learning from the Pro Tour. Um, I was happy with a lot of stuff. I was happy with the testing that the broader group I was part of did, and I helped contribute to that. Uh, we correctly predicted the meta as being like significant amounts of Starvro, decent amounts of Chain, decent amounts of Prism, a certain amount of Lexi, and a certain amount of, um, you know, Briar. And, you know, we even said, and, and people disagreed with this, and there was a bit of a discussion about it, but quite a few of us even said, with Chain being this popular and Starbro needing, needing all the cards in his hand, we could actually see a Kano in the top eight. And it was kind of funny that that actually, you know, that actually happened and there were two Kanos in the top eight because, you know, several people were actually predicting it. The prediction that, that I had and we had in a group for the top eight uh, was four Starvros, a Prism, um, a Kano, uh, a Chain, and, and two Chains. And I think in the end we got a Briar as, as well instead of another Chain, but, you know, Rune Blades, Rune Blades. Um, so that was quite interesting. In terms of you know how you know i mean i i would say um if you have time and you want to watch some fantastic games of flesh and blood i would go and watch the semi final the final where pablo uh, pintor on uh, on chain was piloting it into stavro um i think they are both really excellent matches both in terms of back and forth flow uh of the game but also just in terms of like how players were reading the opponent's plays and playing around them you know, making sure they optimized damage, making sure they optimized blocking. Like, there's so many things in those games that you as a player can learn from. I, as a player, could learn from. I really do recommend going to watch them. Um, you know, it's kind of funny for me, who are doing this sort of recap thing now, uh, that I know Pablo. I mean, I don't know him very well because um, uh, he's obviously from Spain. Uh, but he used to be one of the best players of the Elf of Art LCG, which I obviously played in quite a lot. Uh, so when I went over to this 400-person tournament in Madrid, I think Pablo was the one who won that. Uh, but he had really good showings at a load of the events. Um, I'm just trying to remember if he won the World Championships once. Maybe. I can't remember that exactly. He might have come second. But uh, he, he basically was one of the best players in that game. So when I saw that he had started playing and that he was, you know, doing well, I was like, this guy could win the tournament. And my friends were like, we've never heard of him. And I'm like, that's not the point, right? Some people are very, very good card game players. And a lot of those people played. Uh, the Elf of RLCG, because it was very skill-based and skill-intensive. Um, so, you know, it's kind of really good to see that these skills transitioning from one game to another. And, you know, it's not just... Because there's a lot of... There was a lot of sort of like, oh, the MTG players are going to come over and they're going to, like, steal uh, the top spots of Flesh and Blood. Um, you know, homegrown Flesh and Blood players. And I'll say, it, it's not just the uh, MTG players that are going to come over and start playing this fantastic new game because the, the game is fantastic people want to play it especially if you're coming from a game that's been cancelled or killed off and you're looking for a new home there's a reason that loads of the x ffg lcg players are playing flesh and blood they don't have a game to play anymore they want one so now they're coming into flesh and blood and proving that skill at card games is transferable um and you know they're willing to come in and take the crown um also you know not to blow my own trumpet or toot my own horn, as they say, um, over on this side of the pond. Um, during the calling interview with Yuanji, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a bit of a bit of a rivalry. Uh, perfectly, you know, friendly, fun, you know, not contentious. I'm not trying to create an actual, you know, bit of rivalry. There's no heel turn coming from me. But um I definitely was trying to sort of stoke up a bit of EU US rivalry because in every card game I've played it has existed um, as kind of just like a milestone of competition. And I distinctly remember saying to Yuanji because he was the only uh, one of only I think two or three US people who were playing in the calling that because of what he did at the first European calling obviously Europe was going to have to come and take the Pro Tour. And it was funny then to see that the final was two European players. Uh, the top eight was representation from seven different countries, quite a few of whom were in Europe. Uh, the champion obviously is European, but also the Europeans also won uh, both the Calling and the Battle Hardened. 
And I think this is kind of just coming back to that point because, I mean, obviously where people are from doesn't actually matter. There are good players in every country. It's not like a real rivalry, but it is kind of a fun a fun little uh, game playoff. And I remember telling people, especially from New Zealand and the US, that Europe is really good at card games. Like, Europe is really good at card games. And part of that is that, like, the Nordics and the Germans, um, are, you know, sort of like Northern Europe, doesn't have a lot to do in winter, so they play a lot of cards. Uh, but then you've got places like Spain where people are just mad for the games um, and they have massive communities. And I mean, I think there's already like four or 500 Spanish flesh and blood players. Um, but I've been sort of told that there's a lot of stores that aren't picking it up yet because they don't want to pick up a game in English. Um, so the prediction from the Spanish players I met over the weekend who were talking about that game is that when the Spanish version of Flesh and Blood comes out in, I think, two months' time, they just fully expect the game to just massively shoot up in in Spain. And I mean, I could I could really see the same happening in Germany and France um, as well. Um, and I think it's also Italy, where the, the game is being published in, in the local language. Um, I really, really... You know, James White said it in an interview. He said he could easily see Europe being the biggest market for Flesh and Blood. Um you know, by the end of this year. And I, I genuinely think it, it really could just seeing the way that some communities are picking it up and running with it because it has that sort of really, you know, gritty, not gritty, um, really like eye-catching, hero-centric, you know, gameplay feel that a lot of the European community has been attracted to for a very long time and has been expressed through, you know, Arkham Horror and... Uh, LCGs and things like that, where it's very character focused. Marvel Champions is really big in 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 Europe as well as Arkham Horror, but obviously it is a TCG and it has a lot more competitive flexibility. And Europeans love competitive card games, especially as well. So, you know, really, my message to those of you in America, and obviously, I, <laughs> you know, one of the functions of this channel is to be a European um, slash UK. I mean, I am Irish and I am British um source of flesh and blood news and provide a different sort of um you know viewpoint on it and i will say that the european market is going to explode later on this year and europeans have come and they've shown you that you know where's the best region for playing flesh and blood who won the calling the battle hardened and the pro tour it's just a bit of there and you know there has been a bit of discussion about which region is playing the best version of flesh and blood you know and um, some of the people in you know New Zealand and stuff are making fun of uh, of like Europe and, and the UK for being too aggressive and oh you just you don't play control over there and all this sort of stuff. But I think really what we're actually starting to see is that you know different can be better. Like just because your meta doesn't think this deck is good, it doesn't mean that that deck can't play into your meta very well if someone's willing to put the time and the reps into it. And this is really what I wanted from the Pro Tour, which is why it makes me so happy. Um, to see it happen um, because this was the real test of how those different metas collided and I know that like, different testing groups came out with different opinions right um, some people were saying Chain is the best deck it beats Starbro every time and therefore they were expecting Chain to be the most represented deck at the Pro Tour and they teched for that whereas my testing group was saying Chain is a better deck with a really good skilled pilot but Starvro is an easier deck to win with consistently because it is more capable of high rolling and the pilot can make more mistakes. It's more forgiving. So more people are going to be playing Starvro, not necessarily because it is the best deck. It's because it can win despite not being the best deck and also be much easier to pilot and get through 14 rounds with a lot more wins than Chain. So that was why we said that you know, Starvro is going to be the best deck. So there is something I want to talk about now. Um, it's a bit more of a controversial topic, but I really do need to address it because a lot of people spoke to me about this over the weekend. Um, actually, let's just, I want to put a pause on that. I'll finish, I'll finish the video on the controversial topic. I just want to finish wrapping up talking about the Pro Tour um, just as a personal thing from a content creator because I want more people to hear this. And I know you guys will stay around for the controversial topic, which is, you know, me just baiting the hook, really. Um, like I put out a tweet this morning um, and I kind of really, you know, it kind of just perfectly sums up my feelings. So if you're not following me on Twitter, I really would, because I do put out a lot of tweets and photos and stuff there. I do like having chats to people on, on Twitter and, and seeing what's going on. But like really, 
it's hard for me to articulate exactly how much this event like meant to me as a content creator um like just just like personally okay because obviously i casted the calling and that was a huge milestone because lss was saying hey we like what you did and i've spoken to ls over the weekend and their feedback on on the content on the casting was really good they told me they actually loved it so you know that was really really positive and reinforcing to hear and it means that you know i know i'm competing with very strong brands shall we say that are already existent in america you know and you've got the matt rogers and you've got tannen grace and you've got flake and you i've met all these people now it's fantastic and kellen and all these people who are really good casters and obviously they can cast a pro tour but you know doing it them saying it was good that's a really good feeling but going to the pro tour and just you no know, my experience walking through the hall someone would just grab me and say hey i like your content you're doing a really good job someone would be like hey i want a photo with you um it was weird it was weird for me because i mean in my head and and in reality still a very small content creator i have a thousand one hundred subs i got an extra 30 over the weekend so thank you all the new subscribers and just you know you know i'm still very small i'm competing with people with ten thousand. i'm competing with people who have you know, 10,000 followers on, on Twitter and who've casted MTG and all these other things. And it is kind of competition because people can't watch everything all the time. And, you know, going from the environment where I'm just making these videos and a few people reply in the comments or a few people join the Discord. I do have a Discord. You can just join it. It's it's linked in the comments. Um, and I do stuff in there. I organize gameplay sessions and things in there with people um, and just chat. You know, it's where it's the first place I go to to chat with people. Um, and hopefully that will grow over the, the time. But, you know, that that's that's limited because people won't necessarily engage with you in the comments unless they have something to say or they won't come to this or, you know, all that kind of stuff. But they're much easier to just grab you if you're walking around and say, hey, I think you're doing a fantastic job. And, you know, I lost track of the number of people who just grabbed me and said, hey, I really like your content. I mean, we're talking 100 people just saying that as I'm walking around. Um, and, you know, people actually being like, no, I want a photo with you. And I'm like, OK, yeah, cool. I'm here. Um, <laughs> and because I was doing that myself, like I was like, oh, I want to I want a photo with Rudy because Rudy's like, I really like his straight talking videos. I want to meet Saint. I want a, a photo with like Tannen and Flake. And I want to meet like Chris Sires. And, you know, there's, there's all these content creators that I personally follow who are bigger than me. And I want to meet them and I want to, you know, just say I really appreciate what they're doing. You know, and I was doing that as like my fan fanboy kind of thing, you know, meeting James White, making sure I'm talking to the LSS team and, and you know, asking their questions and, and getting to know them a bit better because uh, that's my line to get more contacts and content, you know, um, and just generally, you know, trying to make sure. I mean, I like Steve Argyle's art, for example, for 25 years because he did art for the original uh, L5R CCG, so Legend of the Five Rings uh, CCG, which I played when I was a kid, you know, when I was 12 and his art was there. So me meeting Steve Argyle and asking him for a custom altar, which I'm going to get back hopefully in a couple of weeks and I'll show with you guys, was just amazing, right? But people were also doing that to me. And here I am just being like, wait a second, this is this is a thing. I'm actually in a room where more than like a few people know who I am, follow my channel, have seen my stream of, of Krakow, you know, all that stuff. And it's just a bit crazy. And what really hit it home for me and like, you know, because numbers on YouTube is one thing, but people actually saying it to you is another. Um, so someone came up to me and this is this is actually like someone asked me what my highlight of the weekend was. And obviously playing in the Pro Tour and all that stuff was amazing. And, and LSS did a really good job at everything. And I, I told them that on the day. I thought it was uh, brilliant. There were some issues we'll talk about later on because we've got, you know, what went wrong, things that weren't great and some controversial bits at the end. But, um, you know, Someone came up to me on, I think it was day three, and they were going around and getting content creators and people to sign their Heart of Fiendal playmat. Now, let's put aside the fact that this is a $500 playmat as of the making of this video. It is worth tons of money. It is gorgeous. I would not put ink on mine. I don't, I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not touching it. It's gorgeous. I'm going to use it. Um, I have to now choose between my Spring Tunic and my Heart of Fiendal playmat. That is a difficult decision. Um, 
So I'm, I'm probably going to have to use both or figure out a way to use both. But this guy's going around and he's getting signatures from content creators he likes, um, you know, and, and making sure that they're on there. And, you know, he opens it up and he's like, I'm like, OK, he's, he must be doing this for loads of people. Um, you know, he's, he, he's, you know, I'm included. That's great. Um, but, you know, he opens it up and in the middle, there's Rudy's signature. And on the right, there's James White's signature. And then there's open the box. And I think Brendan Patrick had already signed it as well. And I'm literally like the fourth or fifth person to sign this play mat. And he's like, no, I really wanted to get your signature on it as well. And I'm taking out a piece of paper because I've never signed my name as steel fur on anything. I don't have like a steel fur signature. And this guy was like, yeah, yeah, I absolutely, you know, sign it wherever you like and just do it, do whatever. And I'm just like that. It really just hammered home the fact that like people like my content, but also like, some of them really like it and want to engage more with me. And uh, it was just a special moment for me as a content creator. Um, uh, that especially, it, I was really genuinely touched by that. And, and, you know, that was kind of, I mean, it was enabled by the fact that the playmat and the water bottle and Yorick and all of those things were just such amazing, amazing promos. Um, and just amazing. I mean, you know, when I saw that Heart of Fiendal playmat that no one knew was coming, I. I was just completely bowled over. I mean, it is so gorgeous. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the French Pro Tour gives out an Eye of Aphidia playmat. Because they obviously, the French YouTube channel is La Eye of Um, That would be a really nice touch. They might give Heart, Heart of Fiendel again, or it might have been a once-off for Pro Tour, the first Pro Tour. But it would be really cool if every Pro Tour gave out a Fable playmat. Um until they ran out of it right you know or something like that i don't know uh but we'll have to see about that uh you know who knows um so on to i guess we have to acknowledge the issues with the event right so uh, we've talked about the positive in my last two videos as well nothing but positive the games were great everything ran on time lss was super approachable james white was taking photos with everyone signing everything um you know they were you know, even the people from LSS would just chat to you. you know, like Alan Hale would talk to you. The the developers would talk to you. you know, there were so many people that you could just talk to and, and talk to you about the game. And the vendors there were great. Like one of the vendors had literally bought boxes of commons and tokens and rares because they were like, people keep forgetting tokens and rares. We brought Majestics the last time and people kept being like, do you have this rare that I need for my deck at the last minute? So they actually just went out of their way to bring stacks of tokens, and rares, and commons. So shout out to Midmax Games for doing that. It was a really great. Uh, I I even took a veil of it when I realized I didn't have a ride after the battle hardened. I was like, can I get a ride token? They were like, cool, no problem. Is two thousand welcome to raid tokens? You can get whatever you like. So Midmax Games definitely a shout out to them for doing that. You know, and also just being a great vendor on the site. There were loads of other vendors on the site. Any of the artists in was great um you know but there were there were definitely issues i think it's worth talking about that some of them are just like unavoidable logistical issues um but also communication issues uh there were not a lot of people but definitely a chunk of people who thought that they could for you know whatever reason show up on the day and buy a ticket to the calling now obviously i always recommend if you're going to an event you're traveling five hours for it you buy your ticket in advance but I know that's coming from a position of privilege where I get paid monthly and, you know, a decent amount and I can buy my tickets in advance and put it on credit if I don't have it right then and all that kind of stuff. And some people don't have that luxury. I mean, I know multiple different types of people are playing flesh and blood, but I think if you're going to a big event, obviously buy your ticket in advance. But that does kind of come back to where we are in terms of could LSS have avoided that disappointment for a lot of people? Um, genuinely the sentiment i heard from a lot of people was just it would have been better if lss had given an idea of the max size of the venue um, and whether it could scale up or down and that might be a learning in the future then for lss to sort of you know if, if you're running it in a venue that has like a hard cap uh, that you think you might hit you know then you might want to just like tell people what that hard cap is and then they can kind of get an idea based on how popular it is and how many people are talking about it whether or not they want to take that risk of showing up and not being able to play so if you had said the calling has a, a cap of a thousand um you know and updated when it was half sold out for example that might have encouraged people to buy tickets a bit more early or at least i guess put some context to the risk they were taking by not buying a ticket and showing up i think that's a big learning i think also there was a bit of um frustration that 
a lot of the Pro Tour players did return tickets. Like I myself returned a fabled package. Um, and people were told that if they showed up on Saturday morning, there was a chance that they could buy a ticket. But it doesn't seem like a lot of tickets were sold on Saturday morning. Um, in fact, one person said that it, they did the sit down and they did the um, you know the player meeting. And there were loads of empty tables and there were loads of people who would have liked to take those empty tables. Uh, but that wasn't really coordinated. Um, and I will say that I have been to large events and I know it is difficult when you've got that many players um, to, you know, add in extras. But I have been to large events which have said, you know, the player meeting is at eight or nine. And then once we have determined who has not showed up, showed up on time, we will actually be delaying the start of the event to add in extra players up to the cap that we are allowed to have for the event. So how that works is you do the player meeting, everyone comes in sits down and you have a queue of people off to the side who want to get into the event but aren't you go around you make sure you've got every table that doesn't have a person at it after five minutes you take those people out you take however many people you took out and you add those people in uh you sell the tickets you get a lot of money uh, and everyone wins because the tournament is bigger um it's it's annoying logistically because when, once people are there sitting down they want to start playing uh but also a lot of people are happy to get more players into the event so there can be some like leeway where people are content with that and i have i have been to events where that has happened um, it is difficult 100 percent, it is but potentially for an event that is this popular with this many people in the hall it, it could have been a good avenue to explore right and i mean i know people who are better at organizing events than i am and i'm sure they're going to tell me all the ways that that isn't possible but i know i have seen it done and i have seen it work quite effectively um so you know that's an interesting thing just to explore and consider um one thing i kind of want to talk about and i find it's um you know it, it's interesting right because you know there is yeah and actually I'll, i'm just gonna i'm just gonna read right because um one of the guys who, who i whose opinion i trust immensely on this um is someone who used to run L5R events for the CCG, the LCG for years, and he's handled upwards of, you know, a thousand people at an event, you know. Um, and he just says, you know, if you think about it, the amount of space allocated for the calling is equal to the number of people who have pre-registered. Um, you know, you're, that's how many you plan to show up. And if people haven't pre-registered, you can't plan for them to show up. Um, yeah. And he kind of says, you know, he said what I said, which is that you can get people seated and then sell their space on, but it does add about half an hour to to an hour just to add them in. Um, there is basically this thing where people are suffering from success, um, and we're all just kind of hoping that by the time Leal comes around, they've got a bit of a better grasp as to how to deal with the large number of people who want to show up, because I imagine Leal is going to be huge as well. Um, so that's kind of one part of the friction. Um, the other part of the friction, I don't genuinely know who authorized this, but I think it is worth drawing attention to, is that in my mind, and it was true in Krakow as well, um, I feel like the format for the side event drafts um, is inherently quite flawed. Um, and um, there's, there's two things we need to talk about. We need to talk about the drafts, and we need to talk about prize ticket acquisition and prize scaling. Um, I think those are two issues I just want to talk about briefly. Um, so for the drafts, uh i mean a single draft on site cost 25 dollars. the set available to be drafted was tales of aria unlimited a set which the people running the event channel fireball sell for 65 dollars a box and all the vendors on site sell for 65 dollars a box so you need eight players to draft eight by 25 is 200 which means that there was a markup per box to do a draft of 140 dollars right firstly that's that's a big question mark why is a draft so expensive when the box to draft it is really cheap um if that is the only box you you've got available as well you should be making that box available so you could offer cheaper drafts but the main thing i object to really um because obviously there is the factoring of the event space needed to run the draft and you want to not make it too cheap so people can't just farm them uh, for tickets and things like that but i will say that i also just fundamentally object to the format of the drafts now i didn't play a single draft all weekend but i did speak to my friends who did and the people that i know who were drafting all weekend 
were the newer players, right? Because the, 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 the established players, the serious players, they were all in the calling or in the pro tour. But you had more casual people who hadn't done so well in the calling or the pro tour that thought, hey, I'll play some side events, that'll be fun. Those were the people who were drafting, right, a lot of the time. And the draft format, for those not aware of it, is single elimination, right? So you pay your $25, you do a draft for about 40 minutes, and then you play one game, and if you win that game, then okay, you get to go on to the next game and et cetera, et cetera, until you lose. But if you lose that game, you're out and you don't get anything. So you've paid your $25, you get three packs that you could have bought from the prize wall for $10, I think, maybe 12 uh, if we're pushing it. Um, and then you get nothing. So you don't even get like some tickets for participation, even like 20 or something, you know, some small amount um, just to make it better. And you also just don't get to play more games. I really don't understand. And you know, I know people have seen those sheets that have like the single elimination brackets on. I can 100% say I've done plenty of events where there is a sheet that handles a Swiss draft um, with three games for each person on it as just as well on a single sheet of A4 paper, as well as a single elimination. Um, and people want to drop, they can just drop anyway. You know, if you, if you didn't draft a good deck and you just want to drop and not play another game, that's up to you. But like the idea that it's single elimination, only the people who win get prize tickets and everyone else gets knocked out means that four of the people who drafted with you are immediately leaving the draft after one game with nothing to show for it except three packs that were double the price that they could have paid and that that to me is actually genuinely unacceptable i think it's something that lss uh need to redress um i think a swiss system that pays out packs per win is much much better um, if you think that the people playing the side events at these tournaments are usually the more casual players who aren't going to be guaranteed to get a win, who might just be happy to play two or three games um, within their draft pod and maybe get some prize tickets for it. And obviously the wins will be Scalar and the person who goes 3-0. But even if I go 0-0-1 in my draft and I get some tickets for that, that's still a much better outcome than just going 0-1 drop um and kind of more justifies the price so I, I really would like lss to revisit the drafting format at their events i think single elimination um when we accept that more casual players are going to be doing these side events and the main players are going to be in the big main events at these kind of um things um needs to be addressed and also just the pricing structure i think if you're going to ask people to pay 25 dollars um you know they should get some tickets just for just for participating to be honest whether they win or lose um, and be given a chance to keep playing even if they lose one game. So I think that that really does need to be addressed. I was very shocked when I heard that it was single elimination and when I heard the price point, um, I just, um, you know, the people I spoke to who were doing them were doing them because they didn't have anything else to do because it was before the commoner event went live. Um, and you'll notice, like, I'm, I'm talking about specific issues. Um, there were huge side events. There was a Blitz double, a Daily double. There was Classic Constructed. There was a commoner event for a law book. Um, there were so many big side events going on that were really fun and I felt like really um, rewarded the people who were playing in them. The UPF one had a cold, uh, gold foil prize and apparently it was huge. Um, and there was a Shiana that like copied KO and then did a 22 power crippling crush on someone, which is exactly what UPF needs to bring. So I'm deliberately not talking about all of the, um, you know, because I've already said how great the event was. Even the side events were great, right? The big side events they were running, they were fantastic. There's a reason I'm talking specifically about issues with the draft is because I do know a lot of people who were in there to draft and they were the more casual, newer players. And it did just feel like they weren't really getting the best experience for their money. And also that it was kind of too expensive for what they were getting as well. Um, it does kind of lead us nicely, though, into our other sort of section, which is like sort of prizes and scaling. Um, myself, I made it day two of the Pro Tour. I didn't get anything extra for making day two. I'm kind of OK with that. The participation prizes we got were fantastic. Um, whether there should be a promo or something for everyone who makes day two is a question mark. Uh, but with those big competitive tournaments where you want to give away stuff that's really worth things, it can be hard to find that middle ground for a promo that is both not worth too much, that uh, you're just giving an extra $500 to everyone who played, but also worth not worth too little that no one actually wants it, right? So it's kind of a tricky area. But definitely for the calling, um, it feels like the prize should scale at least in prize tickets um you know i know people who made day two of the calling but didn't make the prize prizable part of it uh i didn't get anything like after all of that fighting in an 800 person was it 800 person field i think uh but just didn't get 
any prizes. There should be some sort of scaling, whether it's prize tickets or a promo or something that gets added in um, if the event is going to be large enough. And LSS knew how large it was going to be. Um, but I think if you take the fact that the Pro Tour players are happy playing in the Pro Tour, they got their participation prizes, they were fantastic. Uh, and obviously you're competing for that big money and that big competitive recognition. But I feel like when you're looking at something like a Corley or a Battle Hardened, we kind of need some scaling. We need some sort of reward for people um, who do well but don't like get the top prize because it's a real big thing when you show up to an event that large and you go like, you know, I don't know how many rounds there were in the corner, but you go like 10, 10, 3 or something and you don't make the top cut or make one of the prizable slots, but you just don't get anything to differentiate yourself except, you know, a bit of XP from someone who didn't do as well. And the Battle Hardened actually did this better than the calling. Um, it wasn't announced beforehand, but I saw a sign go up at some point during the day uh, that the Battle Harden was awarding ticks, uh, prize tickets based on the number of uh, wins you got. And I really don't understand why that system wasn't applied to the calling. Because interestingly enough, right, if you wanted something off the prize wall, right, and you were playing in the Pro Tour or the call and the calling, um, you did not get prize tickets for either of those events, right? Your only way of getting prize tickets was from side events or from the Battle Hardened on Sunday, which caused two main problems. Of course, firstly, some of the better players in the venue couldn't get something they wanted from the prize war because no matter how well you did in the Pro Tour, you didn't get prize tickets and the calling as well. Um, and also there was a huge queue on Sunday because the majority of people got their prize tickets from wins in the Battle Hardened, which meant that when the Battle Hardened finished, there was a queue of like 300 people trying to get their prize tickets so that they could rush to the prize wall with their friends and buy something before it sold out, like before the, the Arcane Rising boxes sold out or the Ira um, print sheet sold out. They had to get there first, which led to a bit of a hectic queue situation where people were rushing to try and get in, get to the prize wall and buy stuff, uh, because that was the only real opportunity that those players who, you know, who would say played two days of the Pro Tour and then the Battle Hardened or Day One Pro Tour, Day One Calling, Battle Hardened, had to actually win prize tickets because they were playing in the main event. So that's kind of interesting and kind of weird. But the only opportunity to win prize tickets is if you weren't playing in the main event. And that meant that, you know, there was this weird rush on the last day. And there was also a lot of people who just didn't get prize tickets um, to spend on anything from the prize wall. Uh, which just kind of feels weird because you're there playing in the biggest event in the format. And there's this big prize wall and you just don't interact with it at all. So it's kind of odd. I mean, you've got lots of other stuff. So again, this is all balanced complaining, right? Because... I'm not going to sit here and tell you as a person who showed up to the Pro Tour and got handled a water bottle I had knew nothing about that's super cool and a, a Heart of Fiendel playmat. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I didn't get some sweet swag for qualifying for the Pro Tour. And the Pro Tour was also free uh, entry. I'm not going to say that, right? I feel like I got plenty of stuff just for playing in the Pro Tour. And also just the, the value of playing in the Pro Tour to me as a player in terms of learnings and the games I had and how tight everything was in terms of you know the experience so i'm not going to sit there and do that okay last so th but that's just general feedback things i've heard from people the calling selling out was a big big issue uh if people have, have said you know if there was a thousand person cap on the calling why don't they say it's a thousand person cap on the calling 500 tickets have sold out 600 tickets have sold out 800 tickets have sold out you know last place is going now um etc etc why wasn't there tweets like that you know, in the run-up to the event. I think there was one or two, like one or two days before, but I know that, they, that maybe there could have been more communication from the start as to how, how small the venue was and, and that kind of thing. And then, of course, of course, the price of drafts and some of the side events and how they actually rewarded or enabled gameplay. I mean, um, single elimination draft doesn't enable gameplay. You just play one game, right? Um, the only other thing of controversy I want to deal with, I've left this to the end because, you know, you know, I kind of leave these these spicy bits at the end, mostly kind of to keep people listening, but also for the diehard fans. I like you to have the, the hottest takes. Um, some content creators really suck. Um, I'm just going to come out and say that now. Um, some content creators really suck. Uh, I don't want to name names. Well, I do want to name names, but um, to me, I just, I don't understand um, why a content creator would think it's basically acceptable to, in my mind at least, lie to their audience, right? Um, and this is kind of a hot and kind of aggressive take, but it did really, really irritate me. And, you know, and you guys who, who listen to my channel very often know that I try to avoid getting too emotive or worked up about stuff. Take a step back, take a deep breath, analyze it analytically. But let's talk about this then from an analytics perspective. What is the problem? In the up to the Pro Tour, many content creators put out articles about what they thought the best hero was going to be. 
right? So we got Tarek Patel's telling everyone they didn't think Prism was very good. They thought Chain was the best deck with Nick Knack, Bric a Brac, um, and they thought uh, Starbro wasn't very good now either, right? What deck was Tarek playing at the Pro Tour? It was Starbro? So what was that article that he published three days before? We had loads of people on Twitter saying they weren't really sure what they were going to play. I kind of believe that to an extent, based on the fact that those guys end up showing up on Kano. But, um, you know, there was certainly a bit of, oh, Chain is the best deck, everyone's going to be playing Chain. From a lot of people who didn't show up playing Chain, right? Now, I know it's a pro tour, and I know you want to get a competitive advantage any way you can. And Maybe this is me being naive, but I believe that there is, a, we'll call it a social contract, a light social contract between me as a content creator and the viewers of my channel to not deliberately mislead you, right? Now, if I've tested and I think something's true and that disagrees with what ends up happening or if I make a last minute shift or all these kind of things, things happen. And I, I'll just say, put my hand up and say, look, that happened. You know, two days before I changed my mind and we switched decks and all this kind of stuff. But I'm not going to put out a video that like two days before that is deliberately wrong, right? I'm not going to put out a really sort of in-depth analysis breaking down my testing before the event and then giving an incorrect conclusion, you know, that I'm not even following myself, right? You'll never see me... Because I, I did put out a tier video after um after the Viscerai changes and after the Band of Restricted changes. I mean, we can bring that up. Um, I mean, we can, we can bring that up and you can see my genuine thoughts. Um, at this point in testing, when I did this, um, Prism was still doing very well into Stavro. Viserai was hurt a bit by the changes, but was still very, very aggro. I didn't correctly anticipate how good Chain was into Starvro, because um, we hadn't reached that point in our testing yet. So I put out this list, which has, you know, these heroes on 1.5. We saw a Briar in the top eight. We saw Lexi doing very, very well on day two. We saw Katsu not do very well, which I was a bit disappointed by, to be honest. I thought he would have a bit more reach. Um, and we obviously saw Viscerai just completely drop out, but that was kind of me underestimating the backlash um, the banning would have on Viscerai and how much Viscerai would become a sort of a, a worse version of Chain. And then we had this down here. Now, I look, people will be like, how is Kano a tier two hero? In, there was two of them in the top eight. The point is that Kano is always going to be that. He's always going to be that tier two, tier 1.5 hero that does very well when no one expects Arcane Barrier. Um, and then does very badly when people put Arcane Barrier into their deck. So if you can correctly call that moment where there's a very, very heavy aggro field with someone like Chain, and there's, um, you know, no AB being played and drop the Kano then, Kano is always going to function that way. He's always going to function as this sort of like, you know, shark-like figure who comes in and eats people when they, they're they not properly prepared for him. And in some ways, you know, because I had lots of chats with... um. The developers and the designers of flesh and blood over the weekend and kano was one of those questions that came up because it's like you know when he's too powerful he's just going to win every game and when he's not powerful enough he doesn't have that much impact and the fact is that kano is designed as this release valve hero who makes people respect him and is there to occasionally come in and just blow up a tournament that doesn't account the wizards take the wizards into account right and that is kind of one of the, the reasons he has been developed the way he has been and one of the reasons that james white likes him so much is that he has that capability to come in when people aren't expecting him and do well at these tournaments where people don't have the arcane barrier they need so that's kind of an interesting um you know an interesting point on, on kano so he, he's still kind of in my mind a tier 2 or a tier 1.5 hero he doesn't suddenly become a tier 1 hero because he did well at the pro tour because if everyone was running arcane barrier 3 he might not do nearly so well so you know there's also questions to that but this was genuinely my honest thoughts from that moment I wouldn't put a list out like this, um, you know, a list out like this uh, and and put in things that I didn't think were true. And I think that's just very important to understand. Whereas, you know, I genuinely have seen multiple content creators do that in this period. And I think that's kind of, you know, it's brought us to a point where I think really we can't, you know, I, I, I perfectly respect, and I did this as well. You'll notice the date of this video is the 25th of April. So I did this video deliberately before the testing group I had had a big meeting about the meta, which is why there are probably more mistakes in this than there would have been if I had done this this you know a week later when we had already started doing a lot of testing. And I'm completely okay with that. 
I would rather put out information that is wrong because I haven't reached the point of the information. And when I was doing this video, I said, I don't have you know a full information. We haven't started testing yet, but this is my initial thoughts based on the changes. You know, Viscerai is still a very, very strong aggro deck, even without Skeleta. Starvro is fantastic. Prism is very good into Starvro. All of those things were then later changed or, or, or justified. I didn't put out a second video deliberately um, because then I explained this to some of the people who met me in person over the weekend. Because when I'm testing with a lot of people really in depth, it's not really fair of me to take all of our knowledge and all of our testing. Our server, the UK server, we had like three, four hundred games played, lots of data coming out of that. I'm not going to take that video data and put it on a video until after the big event. Um, even now, I'm probably not going to share it in detail. Um, I'm going to talk around it a bit. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to do that because that's not my data alone and I don't own that data. Um, so it's not really fair of me to do. So that's why you didn't see a tweet from me being like, oh, you know, this is the best deck. Everyone should be playing it. I, I just let people come to their own conclusions because it's unfair of me to do that to the people I'm testing with. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's genuinely just a moment of inflection, we'll say, and a moment of contemplation uh, for the Flesh and Blood content creator community and, and definitely their fans as well as to who told you you know, they thought that a certain deck was the best deck and then showed up on it, right? That's a question. Who told you that their secret spice was this and then showed up on something completely different or showed up on just playing Starvro or, or showed that? Because that's, that's going to guide your future interactions with those content creators. And I know I started this section by saying they suck, but I genuinely think that, and you know, it's not just, that's not just my opinion, right? I don't like it personally because I just don't understand you know, I think it violates a, a social contract between um, a content creator and their audience where I'm at least going to try and tell you the truth as I understand it as often as possible. And if I get something wrong, I'll say sorry and I'll tell you why I thought it was right and then I'll move on because I, you know, I guess I worked in PR for years and I kind of see myself more in a journalistic function than an egoistic function. It's not about me. It's about me telling people what's happening and conveying things to people in a positive way and going to lss and finding out bits that you can't find out because you don't have the time or the energy to put into the game and then giving them to you so they are accessible to you you know i asked someone who you know people you know you're asking you know, what's james white's favorite hero they say kano and someone else was like no no maybe it's prism and i was like okay well, why is it prism and you know they didn't have a good answer so i'm not gonna go in massive spiel about oh james white now loves prism but then i think about all the judge promos that keep getting made for prism and the cold worlds that keep being made for Prism. And I'm just like, maybe James White's new favorite hero is Prism. I mean, my friend has a bling Prism deck. It's worth about 2.5k. He has every single EA and cold foil and everything in it. And I'm just saying, if the one hero in the game that gets the most promos out of everything, the most cold foils, the most extended arts, um, even the most flavor text, because all the EAs have flavor text on, you know, there's a very good chance that Prism is James White's new favorite hero if Kano is no longer his favorite hero. It also so happens that Prism absolutely smacks Kano. So, uh, you know, I'm just saying there's stuff going on here. My point is that as a content creator, I like to speculate. I like to come up with ideas, but I'm not going to sit here and tell you something that I believe is true if I don't believe it's true. And I think we're at a point where, and I kind of wanted to communicate this because I'm not the person who's been saying this, you know, I dislike it, but I have heard from a lot of people um, definitely a bit of shock from, say, someone who has tweeted out they definitely think Chain is the best deck. They can't imagine bringing anything but Chain to the tournament and then showing up on Starbro. And when I asked people why they were so annoyed, they were like, well, clearly these people are just trying to stack the meta for themselves because if they tell everyone to play Chain and loads of people do play Chain and then they sh that keeps all the prisms out of the meta... Um, and then that also means that Starvro, who they're playing, has a better matchup into the field. Because if you, if everyone thinks that everyone's on chain, no one is bringing Prism. And therefore, Starvro can actually have a much better matchup into chain without worrying about as many Prisms. Now, the reason that this point needs to be hit home, and I've spent 50 minutes talking about it, is that I met people at the Pro Tour who had listened to these content creators saying, chain is the best deck, everyone's going to be on chain, and protect their decks in the meta to directly address Chain as the majority of the field, not Starvro. And we're losing Starvro games 
to those same content creators who were playing Starvro because they hadn't teched for the right meta. And I said to someone, you know, because not everyone can do the same. So my, I knew that Starvro was going to be the most popular deck because I, I had a group. We were doing loads of testing, right? Um, as part of a whole UK big, big testing thing um, and smaller groups as well that were doing testing as well. I was just generally gathering information about what people are playing. I knew that Starvro would be the most represented hero, but I met people who thought that Chain would be. Now, there, there is an argument about wit, what is actually the best deck because Chain obviously won uh, the Pro Tour. But if Starbro, that Starbro in the final had fused one more time, Chain would not have won the Pro Tour. Um, if he had missed, if he had got one more fuse and hadn't missed it, you know, Chain might not have been sitting at the top, right? So Starbro was very much by far, in my mind, if not the best list, it was the best list that was also the least punishing. So Chain can be very punishing, but also, you know, reward skilled play. Um, but Starbro can also just be very... I win without worrying so much about the skill element. You know, not that Starvo isn't a skilled deck, but it does have that capability to high roll um, as much as Chain has the capability to not high roll because you banish all your Art of Wars. Um, so that's kind of interesting to think about, right? So I do think we are at this po point where, you know, people are going to be asking more of themselves as to which content creators they actually trust to tell them the truth um, and who, you know, who they're watching that may not be always telling them the truth because saying nothing is different right if you just can't talk about it because your people are playtesting and you need to keep that secret until you go to the big event that's one thing people respect that people understand that you know people like arsenal pass um don't put out deck techs on the decks they're working on right they did their um i listened to it the night before the pro tour they did their pre pro tour um announce uh like podcast right where they we were talking about chain and how strong chain was that was fine um, they liked Chain, you know, they, I believe that they like Chain. Chain is a very strong deck, and I know definitely um, Brendan Patrick as well has a lot of experience playing Chain uh, from the RTN and the ProQuest season, so he would be very comfortable on that deck. And then they had Kano, who they referred to as the deck, because they didn't want to give away the spice, because if they said Kano the night before, then suddenly everyone's packing AB3, right? And they update all their deck lists on Channel Fireball, um, so that and they were, everyone's running AB3. So, you know, obviously they can't talk about that. That, that makes perfect sense. And they knew that Chain was very strong. They did talk about how strong Chain was going to be. And that was correct. They didn't go and say, oh, we're testing Kano. And they didn't, you know, there's nothing wrong with them saying that. If they had gone out there and said, I don't know who Kano's worst matchup is. I mean, it's kind of Chain. So they did do this a little bit. But if, okay, say, say Chain wasn't actually that good, right? So Chain was actually a very good deck. But if, say, Chain was like 20% less good. And they had gone out there saying Chain is amazing knowing full well that they would be playing Kano, that would be an example of what I'm talking about. But they didn't do that because Chain was actually a very good deck and a lot of people on Chain did very well, even if only one made it to the top the top cut. But, you know, if they hadn't, you know, if they'd done that slightly differently, it would be a problem. So we kind of have to ask those questions. So I kind of wanted to address that. I don't think I want to talk about it anymore. I think I've laid out the issues I have with it and what I think it's going to cause because a lot of people were saying it to me. It's like, I feel like, that person said this and then did something else and i don't know if i can trust their opinion in the future so i think that is going to be an inflection point and a point of discussion for a lot of content creators um going forward so i kind of wanted to address it um obviously i you know never want to be in that situation with people i'd rather not put out a video rather than tell people something that was directly going to benefit me like you know oh you should all buy I don't know, where's a, I've got a cold foil here. You should all buy cold foil young katsus because I have five of them here, right? And just drive up the price of them. I sell them, they're worth more, right? Um, I'm never going to do that. So, um, you know, and if I ever do, please point it out to me and I can slap myself in the face on camera or something like that. Anyway, thanks for listening. This has been an extra long episode of Steel First Speaks. They haven't gone to an hour in a while. I've tried to keep them sort of at the half an hour mark recently just because... Um, that's kind of when people drop off, but I hope the controversy at least has kept people sticking around. And of course, the Pro Tour that we really wanted to talk about. Um, so yeah, just I mean, just to close off and wrap off, Pro Tour was an amazing experience. I loved it. I met people who, you know, I just I met all the people I am a fan of, and loads of my fans got to meet me, and that really helped me understand exactly how many fans I have. It just felt fantastic. Um, so thank you to James White, also a lovely guy. Met him, um, a few times, talked a little bit. Um, you know, he confirmed 
by the way, I am getting a preview card for Uprising that will come out on June the 6th. Um, it will be a ninja card, so stay tuned for that. You know, and, and various other discussions were had, which was really good. Um, you know, and just meeting all of my fans as well, really good. Uh, the competition itself, such a high quality, such a good learning experience for me as a player. Some issues, I do believe that LSS can get these fixed. I do believe that they can be addressed. I just think there are always going to be problems that need to be ironed out at this level of event, but they do need to consider who, you know, for example, is playing in the side event drafts and how they need to um, structure those to make sure those people are having the best time and also a very efficient time for their money. Um, because I think those people do care a lot more about their spend and things like that. And they'll be very, very put off by, you know, side events that are too expensive and kick them out too quickly. Um, so I think that's an issue just to be addressed. And then, of course, the content creator thing, um, which I, you know, I hope people are agreeing with me on that. I hope there's some resonance there. I hope it's not just me that's annoyed about it. I mean, I've talked to about 10 other people or people have brought it up to me specifically saying, oh, did you notice this person said this and then he's on that? And I'm just like, oh. Uh, and they were like, yeah, I really didn't like that. So I, I'm kind of just raising a flag to it, but you guys can let me know if you think it's actually an issue or if people aren't going to care in the long run. I don't know, but I think it's an interesting talking point as a community. Um, as always, you know, I do have a Patreon these days. Um, if you'd like to support the channel, feel free. Um, I will be organizing a giveaway for Herald of Protection uh, sorry, Herald of Rebirth promos via the Patreon um, and a few other things in the next few weeks. So, you know, if you are interested, um, please do um, do let me know, and I will, uh, you know, you know, or or do just sign up and things like that. Uh, the benefits mostly for being a Patreon is obviously you have a direct line to me to ask me questions, chat to me, and things like that. I am once I get a sort of certain number of people planning on doing sort of a one. Uh, once a month Q&A or, or sort of live chat session just about the health of the game, things I've seen, what things are happening, what the meta looks like uh, for all my Patreons. And obviously my plan is to spend at least one one night a week or every two weeks just playing games with Patreons on the server, on the Discord. Um, so, you know, if that's the sort of thing you're interested in, then you can just join in and, and that'll be great. But a lot of it is just supporting me. Um, you know, there's some stuff I would like to get done for the channel, like commission some art, get a video editor to do some more work on the um new player hero guys series because i think that if, if any of my series because you you may not know this if you're an existing player but my new player hero guide series actually has like the most views of most of my videos like it has like three thousand views or something like that and a lot of people are actually coming to that as their first entry point to flesh and blood in terms of what hero they're playing and a lot of their friends are sending them to that video so if i could say invest the money i get from patreon into editing those videos and getting those videos really really clean and nice um then a lot of people would come to those videos and have a really good experience uh, which would help them get more into flesh and blood because people are appreciating them at the moment they're getting a lot of views they're getting a lot of positive feedback but with a i think a little bit more polish and shine it could bring a lot more people into the game in terms of you know here's a really good video that tells you what the heroes do and how to play them and all that kind of stuff so that's kind of like a good milestone for me and one of the things I want to do, and, and there are perks, and obviously, you know, there are things that are going on in the background that I'm going to do in terms of giveaways for Patreons and stuff like that, um, that I'm kind of just working it out as I go along, because obviously I've never had Patreons before, so what I give people who sign up will have to be worked out, but at the moment it's just if people want to support the channel, um, then you are more than welcome to do that, um, because traveling to Flesh and Blood events is fantastic, but it also starts to add up. So, you know, that's kind of it. The Proto was amazing. I'm going to leave it with that. Have a great week, everyone. And I will speak to you soon.